this set of notes, we're going to look at both section 4.7 and 4.8 of the textbook. Both of these sections are fairly short. We're going to look at both higher derivatives and derivatives of trigonometric functions. So we're going to start out with higher derivatives. So the derivative of a function is a function itself. And so, for example, when we would take derivatives um, with respect to x, often it was the case that the derivative also had x in it. And so it ends up that we can take derivatives of the derivative. And this is known as the second derivative, if you take the derivative of the derivative. And if the second derivative is differentiable, we can take the derivative of that, and that's known as the third derivative, and so on. And it ends up that these higher order derivatives, um, they can help us with various types of problems. One such type of problem is going to be finding maximums and minimums. And so if you remember when we first talked about derivatives, um, finding maximums and minimums is very important when it comes to probability and inferential procedures. Now we're not going to get into those details in this class, but this is one reason that you know understanding derivatives as well as higher order derivatives is going to be very useful later on, especially when you go on to take a BST 675. So we're going to just start out here with an example. Um, here we have a function, we have a polynomial, very similar to what you've seen before, and we're going to find the fourth derivative of this function. Now to find the fourth derivative, we'll need to find the third derivative, the second derivative, and the first derivative. So this is going to be an iterative process. We're not going to go directly to the fourth derivative. So we're going to start out by first finding the first derivative. And so this is exactly what we have done in the past. So this here is nothing new. So I'm going to have f prime of x. And then here we have a polynomial. So I'm going to apply the power rule here to find the derivative. And so using the power rule here, we're going to have x to the sixth. I'm bring the 7 out front. So I'm going to have the 35 out front plus x to the fourth, and again bring the 5 out front, so we'll have a 20 here. So this is the first derivative. So next we're going to find the second derivative. And to find the second derivative, all we need to do is to take the derivative of the first derivative. We'll notice that the first derivative here is a polynomial. So just like we found the first derivative, we applied that power rule. We're going to do the exact same here to find the second derivative. Now in terms of notation, when we go to write the second derivative, instead of having a single prime up here, we're actually going to put two primes, and that's going to denote that we're finding the second derivative. And so again, we're going to apply that power rule, and I'm going to have 210 times x to the fifth plus 80 times x to the third. And then to find the third derivative, Again, notice that the second derivative is a polynomial, so to find the derivative of that function we can again apply the power rule. And now I'm going to have three primes instead of two because I'm finding the third derivative. And the third derivative by application of the power rule is going to be 1050 times x to the fourth plus 240 times x squared. And then finally the piece that we were looking for, the fourth derivative, and again, the third derivative is a polynomial, it is a function, so to find the derivative, or pardon, to find the fourth derivative, we take the derivative of the third derivative by, again, application of the power rule. Now you can notice here, to denote the different derivatives, I've been using primes. Once you get past three primes, it starts to get pretty cluttered. So common notation is once you get past the third derivative, to in parentheses up top, just where you would put the prime, we're going to put the number four. And so again, by applying that power rule, we have the following. Oops, I just realized I forgot a zero up here. And notice we could keep on going. There's no reason that we would have to stop at the fourth derivative. And what will happen is eventually, as we take derivatives, notice that the leading term here, this x to the sixth that we started with, it is slowly decreasing in power, and so eventually what's going to happen is we get, we're going to get to a derivative that is equal to zero, and 
after that point, all of the derivatives that follow that would still be zero. Because every time we take the derivative of zero with respect to x, that's going to be equal to zero. So this is one common way um, notationally to write these higher order derivatives. Another common way to write them is we saw that we could write a derivative as follows. So the derivative of f with respect to x. If you wanted to take the second derivative, you would use this notation. So we put a 2 between the d and the f, and we have d x, and then a 2. For the third derivative, we would write it as follows, and so on. Now I will say, in practice, most of the time, I'm looking at taking at most second and third derivatives. And again, it's generally, oops, shoot, sorry. Need to put a four there is what I'm trying to do. There we go. Um, so in practice, most of the time I'm looking at second and third derivatives. Um, there are applications that you will see again in VST 675 where you may want to take, you know, even higher derivatives, but majority of the time, um, second and third derivatives is what we use. And so for that reason, I typically stick with this notation here is what I use the most. But again, this notation is also very, very common. All right, so let's look at another example. Um, here we have another function. We're going to take the second derivative. In order to take the second derivative, I first need to take the first derivative. So I'm going to find the first derivative. So in order to find the first derivative, I'm going to note that I have a quotient here, so I'm probably going to want to use the quotient rule. And I will say, in general, there's kind of a balance between, you know, stating which rules you're using versus just, you know, applying the rule without stating it. I think at this point, since, you know, we're practicing these different rules and we're practicing this content, I think it's a really good idea as we use the different rules to actually say, by this rule or, you know, applying this rule. So it's just that constant reminder of what these different rules are and what we have in our toolbox to use. Um, now, of course, you know, in practice, if I were taking a derivative, I probably wouldn't say, you know, pulling out a constant by the power rule, by the chain rule. Um, I may make a note of it for myself. But again, especially at this point, since we're practicing, reminding yourself of these rules, I would like to see as you are applying different rules that you state that you are using them. So again, so here we have a quotient. So we're going to apply the quotient rule to find the first derivative. Now here, notice we're not going to take the derivative with respect to x because we don't have an x in this function. We're going to take the derivative with respect to s. And again, I'm going to find that first derivative. So here, the two functions that comprise this quotient in the numerator, I have a 1. 1 is a function of s. It's just a constant function. In the denominator, I have the second function, which is s squared plus 2. So applying the quotient rule, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the derivative with respect to s of the numerator. Again, since that is a constant, that derivative is going to be equal to 0. And I'm going to multiply by the function that is in the denominator. And then I'm going to subtract off the function that is in the numerator multiplied by the derivative of the function in the denominator. And again, I'm taking the derivative with respect to s here. And then again, by that quotient rule, I then divide by the function in the denominator squared. So next we're going to find the second derivative. So in order to find the second derivative, I need to take the derivative of the first derivative. Notice that the first derivative is also a quotient. And so in the numerator, I've got my first function, which is 2s. In the denominator, I've got my second function, which is s squared plus 2 squared. Now, in order to take the derivative of that function of the denominator, I notice that I'm also going to need to apply the chain rule. And so here I'm going to write by the quotient 
and the chain rule. Now, technically, I'm also using the rule that allows me to pull out constants. That is usually the rule that, you know, if I'm going to write down the rules that I'm using, I generally don't state that one. Um, it's pretty obvious. It's really the application of quotient, chain rule, um, product rule. Those are the ones that, you know, if I'm going to note one, that I, I want to make sure that I note. All right, so again, to find the second derivative with respect to s, we're going to take the derivative of the first derivative. So looking up here at the first derivative, um, first thing I'm going to do is that negative 1 is out front, so that is a constant, so I'm just pulling that negative 1 um, out as a constant, and now I'm going to take the derivative. So in the numerator, I have 2s. The derivative of 2s with respect to s is just 2, and then I'm going to multiply this by the function that is in the denominator. I'm going to subtract off the function that is in the numerator multiplied by the derivative of the function in the denominator. Now take the derivative of the function in the denominator. I do need to apply um, the chain rule. And if you'll remember from the section in the chain rule, um, what we did was we had um, a special, or I don't want to say special, we had a power rule that was generalized. So we had that generalized power rule. And so that's really what I'm applying here, which is again just application of the chain rule. So to do that, I will have 2 times the inner function, or I should say the outer function, sorry, the outer function evaluated at the inner function here, and then multiply by the derivative of that inner function, which is just going to be 2s. Okay. And then again, in the denominator, I'm going to have that denominator function squared. Well, in the denominator, we have s squared plus 2 squared. So if I square that, that is now going to be to the fourth. All right, so I've got the derivative, but, you know, we always want to simplify things. So that's what I'm going to go through and do next. So starting out here, the first thing that I am going to note is notice that in my three terms, all of them share an s squared plus 2. So I can cancel out this s squared plus 2. The 1 to the 4th is going to be to the 3rd. And the 1 squared is just going to come to the 1 power. So now rewriting my terms, I'm going to have 2 times s squared plus 2. Minus, here in the multiplication, I have 3 2's. So I have 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 is 8. I also have two s's, so I have s squared, and then again divided by s squared plus 2 to the third. Then next, here in the numerator, I'm going to have 2 s squared plus 4 minus 8 s squared divided by s squared plus 2 cubed. Oh, notice this is going to become negative. I've got 2s squared minus 8s squared, so I have minus 6s squared plus 4 divided by s squared plus 2 cubed. And then I'm going to go ahead and pull in this minus sign, so I'm going to end up with 6s squared minus 4 divided by s squared plus 2 cubed. So notice taking these higher order derivatives is really the exact same thing that you've done previously in terms of using the tools that are, you know, in your toolbox, you know, these different rules that we've seen. It's just, you know, you're taking a derivative of a derivative, but since that derivative is a function, it's really the exact same thing that we've done previously. All right, so next we're going to look at derivatives of trigonomic functions. Um, your textbook goes into a little bit more detail than I'm going to in this video. Um, they do talk a little bit more about how to find these derivatives. I'm not going to go through that, but I do recommend, you know, as always, reading through, you know, this section in the book. But the most important conclusion from this section is here are the derivatives for common trigonomic functions. And just as an example here, we're going to look at the derivative of the sine of x. And so keeping in mind that 
what the derivative does for us is it tells us the slope of the tangent line when evaluated at certain points. So let's look at a couple points on this plot. So here we have the plot of, again, sine of x. Notice that when we evaluate sine of x at pi over 2, so in other words at this point right here, that the slope of the tangent line is equal to 0. Notice also when we evaluate at 3 pi over 2, we also get a slope of a tangent line is equal to 0, negative pi over 2, slope of a tangent line is equal to 0, and at negative 3 pi over 2, tangent line equal to 0. And you can imagine if we continue this curve out, we would see similar patterns. So we know that whatever function is equal to the derivative of sine of x, when we evaluate it at these points, then that function needs to be equal to zero. Well, let's consider cosine of x. So down below in the red, we have a graph of the cosine of x. Notice that when we evaluate cosine of x at three pi over two, we get zero. Pi over two is equal to zero. Negative pi over two is equal to zero. Negative three pi over two is equal to zero. And so we can see this, is, this isn't, doesn't by any means prove that the derivative of the sine of x is equal to the cosine of x. But doing a couple spot checks, that does line up. And we can do spot checks at other points. So for example, consider the point when x is equal to 0. So when x is equal to 0, so at this point right here, notice that the tangent line is going to occur at the line y equals x. And the slope of that line is 1. And notice that the cosine at 0 is equal to 1. And so you could really do this for any of these points to kind of get you know, an intuitive feel for what is happening here. And so it ends up that, again, the derivative of the sine of x is equal to cosine of x. And your book goes into a much formal discussion of how to find these derivatives. But let's apply these rules and find a couple derivatives for trigonomic functions. So we're going to start out here with f of x is equal to 3 times the cosine of x minus 2 times the sine of x. So if we want to find the first derivative, we will have f prime of x. Now we know that any time we have a function that is a sum of functions, we can you know, look at the derivative of each of those pieces separately and then add them together. And then we also know that we can pull out constants by our derivative rules. So this is going to be equal to 3 times the derivative with respect to x of cosine of x minus 2 times the derivative of sine of x with respect to x. And so if we go back up here and we look at our rules, we see that the derivative of the cosine of x is equal to negative sine x. So this is going to be equal to 3 times negative sine x minus 2 times the derivative of sine x. And again, if we come up here, we see the derivative of the sine of x is equal to cosine of x. So I think these look intimidating at first, but once we apply the rules, we can see that it's actually pretty straightforward. And then if we wanted to, we could apply that same process to find the second derivative. So notice here that the second derivative, that 3 is a constant, so doing the same thing that we did before, we're going to pull the 3 out. The derivative of the cosine of x is equal to the negative sine of x. Oops, sorry, I messed that up. Let me back up here. If we want to find the second derivative, we don't want to take the derivative of this, which is what I was just doing. We want to take the derivative of the first derivative. So here, if we take the derivative of the first derivative, we're going to pull out that negative 3. We know that the derivative of the sine of x is the cosine of x. 
minus 2 times the derivative of the cosine of x, which is negative sine of x. And so this is equal to negative 3 cosine of x plus 2 times the sine of x. So we can apply higher order derivatives just like we did earlier in the notes. All right, let's look at another example. So here we're going to find the derivative of f of x, where f of x is equal to the sine of 2 minus x. So we know that the derivative of the sine of x is equal to the cosine of x. But notice here we have a function instead of just x. So we can apply the chain rule just like we have before. So by the chain rule, the derivative with respect to x is going to be equal to the cosine of 2 minus x, but we also need to multiply by the derivative of the inner function, which is 2 minus x in this case. So the derivative of 2 minus x with respect to x is just negative 1, and so here we get minus cosine of 2 minus x. All right, we're going to do something very similar here. So notice here we have that f of x is equal to 2 times the cosine of x cubed minus 3x. So again, we know that if we wanted to find the derivative with respect to x of cosine of x, that that's going to be equal to the minus sine of x. But here we don't have the cosine of x, we have the cosine of x cubed minus 3x. And so that tells me that I'm going to need to apply the chain rule. So by the chain rule, f prime of x is equal to, that 2 is a constant, so it just comes out, so 2 times the negative sine of x cubed minus 3x, but then I need to multiply by the derivative of that inner function. So in this case, I'm going to multiply by 3x squared minus 3. Now I'd like to go through and simplify this. So notice that this is equal to negative 2 times the sine of x cubed minus 3x times 3x squared minus 3. Now typically when we have a function like this, so sine of x cubed minus 3x, the function that we're then multiplying that by, we usually put that out front. And the reason for that is we don't want to get confused here where we're using the parentheses here to denote the function sine of x and these parentheses to denote um, multiplication. So here we would typically pull these out to have negative 2 times 3x squared minus 3 times the sine of x cubed minus 3x. And we could go a step further if we wanted to. Notice we could easily pull a 3 out of this term. And so this is equal to minus 6 times x squared minus 1 times the sine of x cubed minus 3x. So again, in this section, you're going to be applying all of those skills that you've used before. The only difference is, is now when we go to take the derivative of a cosine or a sine, you know, any of those functions, we're going to want to use the rules that are in this box right here. Now, the other thing to notice, and so this is just kind of a note, if you see something that looks like cosine squared of x, just remember that that's equal to the cosine of x times the cosine of x. So in cases like this, you could use the product rule because you have two functions multiplied by one another. So as always, if you have any questions, please let me know.